you know, know, when you're, uh, you're 13 or 14 years old and they carry you to the White House, I mean, the fear, you don't, even if it's your first time that you ever went down there, you've never been there before, but you, you sit there and you see these kids, they come back and they're black and blue. When you were up there, the psychological abuse was just as bad as the physical. Small towns often hide big secrets. The tiny town of Mariana is one such place. The small center of town reflects the joy of a Norman Rockwell painting. Closer to the outskirts of town, however, there exists a different reality. In this quiet part of town, across from a middle school, still stand the buildings that once housed the Florida School for Boys, later known as the Dozier School. This place was a den of unspeakable abuse that remained open for 111 years. The day I got to Mariana, the sheriff uncuffed me. I went with Mr. Hatton straight to the White House and got my first beat. I remember waking up just as we pulled back in to Roosevelt Cottage, brought me in from the back. And I woke up because I was choking. I was laying across that hump and I was actually cutting my, I mean, I was choking. I didn't know where I was at. I don't give a damn how tough you are, how good you are, to lay down on the bed there and let somebody literally beat you like a dog and draw blood. My ass, my backside, was as black as my shirt. One man was brave enough to tell the story, while many men were strong enough to relieve it. For nearly eight years, Ben Montgomery of the Tampa Bay Times followed this story. Each story Ben told was a story of unspeakable abuse. Boys being beaten until they were hardly able to move boys being used for labor. It was clear that Ben had become a narrator for the theater of untold cruelty and savagery. I was reading the newspaper, uh, the Metro section of the, of the Times, and uh, this was in October of 2008. And what happened, uh, these, these five old men had found each other online. Uh, and they all uh, had been former wards of the Dozier School for Boys in the 50s and 60s. And they all shared the same story. They had been abused. They felt like they had been abused by the men charged with their care. And, uh, and they had pulled a, sort of a coup. Uh, they had convinced the state to let them hold a ceremony uh, on the campus. Uh, and uh, the state uh, agreed to seal the White House, this place where they had been beaten. I don't think the state knew the extent of the abuse because they allowed these men to tell their stories, for the first time publicly tell their stories. And the things they said were uh, shocking. They talked about seeing blood on the walls. They talked about being forced face first down on a cot, being made to bite a pillow that was covered with bits of lip and tongue from the other boys, and being beaten by a one-armed man with a weighted leather strap. Um, until their behinds uh, split open. They remembered washing, uh, uh, you know, having to uh, stand in the shower to get, their, the, um, to get their jeans, the blue jeans off because the lacerations had, um, uh, because the blue jeans had actually been embedded in, in, the, in the lacerations. So these were extreme beatings. And they were saying this for the first time publicly. And fortunately, there was a reporter there from the Tallahassee Bureau of the Associated Press who wrote a story about this, and and um, and it ran in newspapers across the country, including including mine. So I saw the story, and I read these quotes from these five guys, and I first thought this can't be true. Uh, I would have heard about something like this, you know. I've been in Florida for several years. Um, uh, it, it, it sounded like a horror story, and so my first question was, is it true? And um, and I thought after that. If these five just happened to find each other, there have to be more out there. And so I can't remember if it was that day or the next day, 
people started walking in to the Tampa Bay Times office in St. Petersburg saying, I read this story in the paper and I was there too and the same thing happened to me. While Ben's demeanor was one of calm resignation, the demeanor of one man crusading against the state of Florida and their indifference was quite the opposite story. Jerry Cooper, the founder of an organization known as the White House Boys, opened his home and told his story. Jerry had been in the school in the early 1960s and he was physically beaten to near death on various occasions. Jerry would tell his story and so would many of the men in his house that day. For nearly a decade, Jerry and his White House Boys have been on the crusade to at the very least receive an apology from the state of Florida for the abuse they were victims of. Each story was more terrifying than the next. I was sent to the Florida School for Boys, AKA Dozier, as a lot of people know it, in 1960 or either early 61. I had a very, very bad relationship with my stepfather. My mother loved me a lot, but the problem was at that time, he never liked me. Especially he did not like me once the daughter came along, which is my sister, Debbie. And uh, I just, you know, I paid the price for living around this man, trying to get along with him in any fashion I could, but it was just totally impossible. He always said to me, you're no good. You'll never make anything of your life. You're a loser. And that's what I live with day by day, plus brutal beatings at times. The man actually knocked me through a screen door in the kitchen one day out onto a concrete patio. I took the door out and everything when he hit me. And then he came out and beat me while I was laying on the concrete. So this was quite common in my house. So it got to the point where I ran away from home and I'd always head to Virginia, towards Virginia. That's where I'm from. And I had an uncle up there told me, if you ever get into a problem bad enough, Jerry, come here. You can live with me. Well, I made not one attempt, two attempts. I made three attempts. I got caught first and second time. One time I didn't even get out of the county and I was picked up, brought home. The second time I ran away, I was picked up by the deputy sheriffs. They took me straight to what we call Juvie in Orlando, Florida, which was on Michigan Avenue. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time in there for the second time I ran away. And on the third time was a charm. I actually got into Georgia and just above Savannah that night, might have been seven, eight o'clock at night, I was hitchhiking. A 59 Chevy convertible pulled up. I got in the car. Well, we went through this town and, and I actually... Uh, was trying to sleep, you know, you know how you try to lean against the door. And I'm leaning against the door, I'm almost sound asleep, and I hear a siren come on. It's back behind us a pretty good distance. And I sit up and I look back at me and I saw the siren, you know, saw the red lights on the car. And I look over, Daddy's doing almost at this time about 80, 90 miles an hour. I said, hey man, what is going on here? Stop, wait a minute, what's going, shut up. Just shut up. Well, the cop was catching us. And then all of a sudden, pow, 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 pow. He loses control of the car, slid down into a creek. Well, he manages to get out just before that cop gets there and he books through the creek into the woods. I'm 15 years old. I'm put in general population for about a week. I remember going about 9, 9.30 in the morning to the juvenile facility to be placed in front of Matty Farmer. I got a newspaper later on the day and the headlines read this, car thieves fail, car thieves, thieves, plural. And I never stole no car, I never stole anything. So I went on in the room and I saw my mother immediately on the right sitting in a chair and Maddie looks at me and says, uh, looking at the paperwork, she says, you know, Jerry, enough's enough. She said, Jerry gets no lawyer, and your son is going to Mariana, Florida. And I thought, oh, my God, I'd already heard about this place. 
If you lived in the state of Florida at that time, you knew about the Florida School for Boys, if you were my age. I knew a couple of boys that had been there. They weren't boys when they got home. Not anymore. Bill Price, Jerry's vice president in the White House Boys, told a similar story. Bill's words, while told in a different tone, were no less painful. I went to Dozier in 1961, was there from 61, 62, and 63. I was there from running away from home. And I had five stepfathers before I was 13 years old. And every one of them were abusive. So I ran away from home, and when they caught me, they carried me home. And my stepfather said, we don't want him here. And of course, my mother's standing there, and she didn't object. So they sent me to Mariana. When I first got there, I thought, hey, this is a beautiful campus. It looked good. It was uh, clean. It was mowed nice. It, it looked like a college campus. It was a nice-looking place. I saw boys out playing basketball, you know. I said, well, I could probably stay here for a while. When I was there, uh, I liked to play baseball, and I played football, and I uh, had strong legs. So uh, the coach, which was Vic Prenzy at the time, came to me one day when I was just out messing around on the, ball, on the football field, and I was just kicking the ball. And he said, how would you like to come and play? And I said, it didn't make any difference to me. But the bad problem that I had, I could play games that were played on campus. I could not play games that were off campus because I had run away. So they, they didn't want to give me a head start. <laughs> I think I was in a mess hall. And they came and got me, and they said, we need to talk to you. So they carried me over, and they had me written up. They already had the paper written out, and they said that I was disrespectful to one of the cottage fathers. I, I really had no idea what I was supposed to have done. Uh, you know, and then, of course, it's been a long time, so I don't remember really. But I know that it was three days after I was there. The first time that I was there, though, for the disrespect, they gave me 25 licks, you know, with the small cells set up in it, had the beds set in, uh, the mattress and the pillow that was there, there was no linen or anything on them. They were just small striped mattresses, and they were nasty, dirty. And, you know, you've got a lot of people that have been on those beds, and they have been beaten, and they either puked on them or they... they uh, would sink their teeth into them, something to bite on, something to, you know. But they were, they were nasty, really nasty. And you were instructed to hold the end of the bed and to turn your head to the wall. They would, uh, you know, if you, you just left uh, something laying on the floor or something like that, they'd find a reason for, to take you down and beat you at the White House. The tormentor that the men spoke of, Troy Tidwell, was a one-armed man with freakish strength and an apparent penchant for violence. While Ben told many stories of him, the men saw him differently, and with good reason. I was originally sentenced to Okeechobee's Boys School in early I think January 1960, and I was only there a few, a few months, and I escaped and stole the superintendent's car and wrecked it in Okeechobee and was held in the county jail and threatened to be beat to death by the warden. Personally came down to see me and told me if he could get me back to Okeechobee, he would beat me to death. But because I had a new auto charge, they give me a new charge and they sentenced me to Mariana. The day I got to Mariana, I went with Mr. Hatton straight to the White House and got my first beat. I actually remember very little about the time I was in Mariana. They kept me on the Thorazine every night. They'd give me Thorazine and I'd go to bed and you know, sleep through it and get up the next morning. I don't remember where I worked, 
I vaguely remember going to school. I vaguely remember going to the chow hall. I remember going to the White House that one time, which was a terrible beating. And I went two other times, which not, were not near as bad. Not so much what happened to me in Okeechobee as Mariana is what it trained me to become. When they let me out, I was so full of hate. I mean, cops, correctional officers, game wardens, it didn't make no difference. If I saw them, I wanted to attack them. You know, I was just, I lived with fear for so long and I stayed scared of beatings for so long that when I didn't have to worry about it anymore, I had more nerve than a 15-year-old should have. And consequently, because I believe personally, because of the trauma I suffered in Okeechobee and Mariana, I went on to be a career criminal. I spent the next 14 years in prison. Was I brutal? Yes. Was I mean? Yes. Did I hate everybody? Yes. And it's been a long fight. I don't like people today. I, I get scared because I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to remember the fear that I had when I was 14, 15 years old. I don't want to remember the five years I've done in solitary confinement. I don't want to remember the 30 days I spent eating peas and carrots on Super Bowl. I try to forget about it. I don't like thinking about it. I don't like talking about it. I don't like telling people about it because most of the time they don't understand, you know? How can you be so bitter at 15 years old? I wish I could explain that better. It wasn't hard to imagine the pain in faces of young boys. It wasn't hard to imagine tears suppressed by shock. The White House was a small building, famous among the inmates. Any attempt at running away, any smart remark, any perceived misbehavior, meant a trip to this little place and the destruction of one's youth. Well, I remember when we first pulled up to the school, it looked like a college campus. It had tree-lined highway, well, not a highway, tree-lined road going up to the main administration. Big sign out front on, on cement or brick said the Florida School for Florida Industrial School for Boys. Uh, they took me to administration and I went through some questioning and like that. And they gave me clothing and they assigned me to a cottage. I was assigned, assigned to number 11 cottage, Cleveland. Um, I was there about three weeks and I was talking to another kid about running away and they found out about it and I went to the White House. That was my first time. And three weeks later I ran and I went to the White House again. You go in and they turn on a fan and they turn on the light, they pull the chain, turn on the light. It has a certain smell to it that it just, you can't get it anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> it looked like an old solitary jail cell. Um, uh, so once they turn the fan on, then of course you go in and you lay down on a, on a cot, which is uh, like a dormitory cot. Put your hands on the rail of the cot. If you move your hands, you, they stop and they start all over again. If you do it twice or more, or if you try to get up, they bring the kitchen boys in. They sit on you or hold you down, and then they start all over again. Um, first time I went down, I was with another kid, so I got to see Tidwell with his tool paddle about yay long, <clears throat> had a handle, looked like it was made of leather, but it could have been wood. And he stood with the paddle to his side. He'd take it out from under a pillow, hold the paddle to his side. He'd lay down on the, on the cot and he would bring the paddle up like this and down. He had one arm, this arm missing. His right foot would always make a certain sound as it twisted when he brought the paddle down. When he brought the paddle down, the cot, being wire <clears throat> and springs, would drive down with your body weight and the blow from the paddle. <clears throat> I got 35 the first time. I got 35 the second time. <sighs> I don't know what I got the third time, but it was less than 20. When we, uh, when we ran, we, 
broke into a store on this little highway. I don't know where it was, somewhere up there, though. But, and alongside of that highway was a railroad track. We broke into the store to get something to eat. <clears throat> and uh, we were walking down the tracks, and a state trooper saw us. And I guess the alert had gone out because he got out of his car and started chasing us with a dog. And started shooting at us, shooting in our direction. And the next thing I remember after that was being back at Mariana. I don't know what happened in between. Attempts at running were a green light for people like Tidwell to use a wooden paddle that would pierce through skin and sometimes leave the boys' nightgowns embedded into their small bodies. So we get up there in Mariana, and it, it was getting late. Got in there after dark, and there was a, a young guy there. I can't remember his name. He was, he was a staff, and uh, he come out and left me, deputy got out and went inside and he come out in about 10 minutes with paperwork and he said, Mr. Cooper? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, get out of the car and follow me. Well, the next morning, I heard the bugle go off, got out of bed. Uh, I think, what the hell we do? We went out to the front yard, we ex did some exercises, I remember that. Fell back into the cottage and then shortly after that, a boy come and got me from the admin building. And uh, he said, you're gonna meet somebody special. I said, who? He said, R.W. Hatton. And I thought, okay, whatever. Go up to the building there. Uh, R.W. R. W. has his office there. And uh, also Tidwell had an office right close to there. So. I sit out on a bench outside of uh, R.W. Hatton's office and there was two boys sitting beside me on another bench and they were doing everything possible that you shouldn't be doing at that time unless you got a problem. I mean, legs going and, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the worst you could see. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? There's something wrong here. And I leaned over quietly and I whispered, I said, is something wrong? And the guy said, you better believe it. So I went in the office and sat down, had my paperwork right in front of him, clipboard, everything. He said, Mr. Cooper, welcome to the Florida School for Boys, which was the name of it at the time. He said, uh, looking at your paperwork here, you like to steal cars, huh? I, I was just got upset. I said, sir, I didn't steal a car. Shut your goddamn mouth, boy. I didn't tell you to talk. I just sit back. This man, you can ask Bill Price this. This man, that expression, Bill, you know, I never have forgotten the day that I met R.W. He had this prune face. He looked like a man and acted like a man that had no friends and wasn't interested in making any in any way, form, or fashion. That is how he acted. You remember this. Always a prune, frown. I never saw that man smile. Never did I ever see him smile. He says, and furthermore, Mr. Cooper, if I catch you talking with a nigger, that's the term, nigger, looking at one, a conversion in any way, at any time, you're going to the White House. And I thought to myself, what the hell is a White House? I didn't have no clue. First time I ever heard the word. He used it. White House. He used it. His office boy says, come with me. And I said, no trouble. So we're walking away from the building. We're approaching the White House, which I still didn't know what it was. He said, look to your right. I said, yeah. He said, that's the White House. I said, and? You don't want to go there. I said, why? You don't even want to talk about it, Jerry. Forget it. You'll learn fast enough. You'll learn. Two o'clock in the morning right after baseball season. I literally, I literally, 
told David Walters face to face that I wasn't going to play football. It was a mandatory sign up. Now, when I griped about that straight to David Walters, I said, Mr. Walters, do you know that I'm only two weeks out of being a pilot? I will be a pilot. And then I'm on the go home list. He said, well, I think you might want to stay for a while and maybe play for the team. I said, Mr. Walters, you are actually asking me to stay for a while and play for the football team. You're not asking me this. He said, I'm asking you. I said, no, I'm going to go home. I don't want to stay here. Are you out of your mind? And I did. I'm jerked out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, literally. And I'm taken to that White House. And I don't think they suspected that I'd do what I did. Because I don't expect that they, they wanted to break my foot, but they did. I knew when I got in that car, it was, it was called the Blue Goose, 1951 Ford, they used to take people to the White House with. And uh, me being the size I was and all, they had a guard outside driving the car. Two of them came in to get me. When we went out to the car, I'm in a nightgown. I have on a pair of underwear and a nightgown. No shoes, barefooted. They push me in the back seat, guard on each side of me. Short distance from there up to the White House, probably two blocks if that. Stop the car at the White House. I knew, I knew what was coming. But you know what I had a hard time believing? Why? What did I do? My heart's going 100 miles an hour. The anxiety. It's just blowing my head off. I knew I had done nothing, nothing. I knew this. I never had a bad mark, never. Not one discipline charge against me, and I'm almost a pilot. We start into the White House. We go up that little sidewalk, and I was thinking right then and there, either break free right now, try to make a run for it, because you're going in that door. But the guards had me pretty good going up there. And everything was going through my mind 100 miles an hour. I'm scared. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm scared to death. Anybody is when they go to the White House, petrified, knowing what's going to happen. Once Tidwell got his composure, he grabbed me by the throat and slammed me against that concrete wall. He busted the back of my head. He had a grip on him like a grizzly bear. He had lost that arm, that other arm, when he was only about six or seven years old. As you live on in life, and here Tidwell's in his mid-thirties, big man, big man. I thought he was gonna kill me by holding onto my throat with that hand. He had so much power in that arm. I seen that man stand on the basketball court, throw a basketball from one end of that court to the other and hit that, hit, hit that board. He was powerful with that arm. And uh, he slammed me against the wall. And at the same time, once my head hit that wall, he stomps my right foot with his boot. And it broke the ball behind my big toe all the way around. Completely fractured it all the way around the ball. By the time they got me on the bed, uh, I wasn't going on that bed, one way or the other, but they got me, they got, they got the best of me. I'm, 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 I'm giving up, there's nothing I can do. They laid me on my stomach, they crossed my legs, and they had, I would not, I, was not, I wasn't gonna grab that rail, like they told God, the hell with you, I'm not grabbing anything, I'm going out of here. They throw my arms over the rail, and the rails are hitting me at the wrist and pushing down on my hands, you can't move. If you try to, you're gonna break a wrist real quick. So that's the position I was in. They crossed my legs, stuck my nightgown with their hand all the way down my legs, tight, just as tight as they could get that nightgown. They kept on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And they had tied my feet, crossed my legs and tied my feet 
with a strap to the other rail. I couldn't go nowhere. And then it came. That first hit with that strap, it sounds like a 12 gauge shotgun going off in that little room. It's that loud when it hits you. I sunk down in that bed a good foot and you're talking an army caught with springs. I mean, whoosh. And then here it comes and you try to tighten up. You ain't got no other defense. You try to tighten up, that makes it worse. But they just kept on beating me. Troy beat me and beat me. He was first to beat me. And I bet he, he hit me a good 60, 50, 60. And then R.W. Hatton got on the strap. He's real tall. And every time he would swing that strap, you could hear it tip the top of that ceiling. Matter of fact, in the White House, there's still scrapes on that ceiling. Because he was so tall, when he would come down, you could hear it go pshh, and then hit you. And he worked on me. It got up to about, from what I understand, there was, I know this, and I'll tell you how I knew how many licks I got. I got 135. Uh, but to make a long story short, I passed out at around 75 or 80 licks. I couldn't go anymore. Uh, you go into shock. You go into terrible shock. That's why I know to this day, there's no way in hell that all of those kids went to that White House and survived a beating. It's impossible. Yeah, a lot of us did. We survived it. But I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of them didn't. There's no way in hell. The school was a graveyard with bodies that had been piling up for years. Many of the bodies were of orphans, too unimportant to be issued a death certificate. I don't think when I first read that story that I knew that the place was still open and still a reform school, quote unquote reform school. Um, certainly, you know, when we took this project on, uh, I had no idea that it would occupy seven years and that it would uh, turn into so many different things. I had no idea that 500 men would come out of the woodwork to say I was there and I was abused too. So uh, it very quickly got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that was driven in part by the idea that um, everyone wondered how the school was now because there was evidence, it, you know, I remember walking back into the, into the, we call it the morgue at the newspaper. It's where we keep all of our clip files. I remember walking back to the morgue and looking up the school and the various names it was uh, called and coming out with a stack of clips that were, that were significant. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there was a clear, clearly established pattern of abuse over a hundred years, starting in 1903 when, when investigators show up and find children as young as six locked in irons like common prisoners. And in 1914 when a fire burns down a dormitory and these boys are locked in dark cells on the third floor, um, you know, killing ten of them. And then in 1918, when there's an, uh, uh, an epidemic, an influenza epidemic, and another 10 die. And then, you know, r right on through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when they're being abused in, uh, in the White House. And the 80s, when there's a civil rights lawsuit brought by the, FDL, um, um, the ACLU, claiming the boys have been uh, hogtied and are being left in isolation or solitary confinement for three weeks. Um, so all of these things were reported on. Nobody ever put them together. And so, uh, and then on top of that, you know, the other driving curiosity was, uh, who's buried in the cemetery? In this cemetery, you know, that that was a part of the first story. This little cemetery that was known, but it was hidden in the woods, and there were 31 pipe crosses. Who were those boys, and how'd they die? That's, uh, you know, that that's what we went in pursuit of. Let's let's finally have a public airing of the sins that occurred at this place. Let's tell everybody the story of Dozier. And, and looking at that clip file, you know what happened? Every time a, a journalist or a reporter or investigator showed up, the, the school, and they, they found this scandal, kids being beaten, kids dying because of the poor conditions, kids being neglected, uh, they would report it and Floridians would be outraged. And then it would and then fall to the wayside. The school would promise to reform, promise to make changes, 
uh, promise a new level of accountability, and then everybody would turn away and, and we'd forget about it until the next reporter showed up 10 years later and found the same thing was going on. So we decided as a newspaper, and I decided personally, we're not going to look away this time. We're just going to grab onto this thing until things are made right. They've had enough chances to change. Let's, let's hold the state accountable to taking care of these children and not hurting them, hurting them abusing them, neglecting them to the point that uh, there's no reform whatsoever. They're just turning out monsters or better criminals. I think I contacted Robert Straley. He was one of the original five guys, and I told Robert um, who I was, and uh, and I told him some some of the stories I'd written before, and I said I am um, I'm not interested in the quick hit story. I want to stay with this a while, and I want to talk to as many people as I possibly can. Uh, and I said anybody who calls you, because he'd set up a website. I said, anybody who calls you, give him my number, and uh, tell him I'd like to talk to him. And so before long, um, you know, I'm, I'm calling these men who are in their 60s and 70s and asking them, tell me your story about your experience at Dozier. And you know, it was the first time a lot of them had, had talked about it. They, they kept it buried for 50 years. Hadn't told a, uh, their parents, hadn't told their wives, hadn't told their children. And so when they started talking, it was like this, this tidal wave of emotion uh, you know, many of them would cry for two hours um, uh, in recalling this story. So it was very clearly a traumatic experience for a lot of people. So we decided to go, not just talk to them on the phone, but go meet everybody we could in person and let them share, let them share their experiences, ask them specific questions. And part of it was, is there anybody alive, any of the old guards who were whose names were coming up in conversations with these men, were there any of these old guards who could be held accountable for what they did? Were there any crimes that had survived the statute of limitations so that these guys could someday maybe achieve a sense of justice? At the time, there were, there were two guys who had been there in the 60s who were still alive, Troy Tidwell and a guy named Lennox Williams, who was the longest serving superintendent at Dozier. Lennox has since died, but we had the chance to question him. But at that point in time, they hadn't talked to anybody who directly pointed to him as, as you know, one of the abusers. Um, there's another guy, Troy Tidwell, known as a one-armed man, who, um, who I tried and tried and tried to talk to. I tried to get him to, to come on the record. So the things these men were saying about him uh, presented him as just a monster, a sadistic, rudderless, uh, moralless monster. And I refuse to believe that any of us are all good or all bad. And so I wondered about his character. Troy Tidwell was the one, the man that inflicted my pain. Tidwell took me down there because I had gotten a fight in the kitchen with one of the other cooks. And I went to the White House and I remember him talking to me on the way down there and telling me how bad it was going to be. It was two guys, Mr. Marbley and Tidwell. Mr. Marbley was a black guy, Mr. Tidwell was a white guy. Back when I was there, they only had the, the black guy can only whoop the black guy. And the white guy was only whoop the white guy. They could reverse to it, whatever they wanted to do. Tidwell says to me, he says, this is going to hurt me as bad as it hurts you. The pain. It didn't hurt him. I guarantee you. I think he got more pleasure out of it, inflicting the pain. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to give the guy a chance to defend himself. And more than that, I wanted to find out what were the or his human characteristics when he wasn't beating boys? Was there another side to the guy? And so I gave him every opportunity. I mailed him letters. I left voice messages for him. I called his ex-wife. I called every one of his uh, children. I finally um, started a conversation with his granddaughter who had 
um, fond memories of him. Uh, she recalled him taking her fishing. She recalled um, that he always sat in the same seat at the First Baptist Church. Uh, she recalled that uh, he used to love to dance the foxtrot and he flirted with the women at the perfume counter at the shopping mall in Dothan, Alabama. So um, I presented that side of him and, uh, and uh, you know, try to create a, a more complete, more human, more accurate picture of who he was, but he uh, never would talk. You are a man that, as big, as bulky, and as much of a jock I was, I'd have never wanted to jump on you because you'd kill me. I knew that. I knew that. I knew how strong that arm was. He was strong. You look up any person that loses a leg or a arm at such a young age, and by the way, I don't know how, well, how did you get a hold of a shotgun at seven years old and blow your own arm off? I wanted to ask you that for 20 years. What happened, Mr. Tidwell? How did you blow your own arm off at seven years old with a shotgun? I wish you'd tell me that because I heard you tell three of the boys in my cottage when I was sitting on the basketball court that night, I heard you talking with them and I heard you state this, sir. You said that when I was younger, when I had to go to school with only one arm, that the kids picked on you, called you every name in the book, downgraded you, and I heard you say that right out of your own mouth. And sir, is this why, is this why you beat children for 42 goddamn years? That's, that's me. You, you, you can take it from me. 42 damn years. Many of the people in Jackson County wanted this to go away. Um, they viewed it as uh, a dark part of the uh, collective history, and many refused to believe the allegations these boys were making. Uh, you know, they found it hard to believe that a guy they sat by in church or ate by in the Wagon Wheel Cafe could march off and abuse boys. Um, so there was a there was a lot of pushback from the locals. Um, they wanted to own their story. They wanted, uh, you know, and these weren't all the locals. These were those who were in positions of power. And I think that's a natural thing. When there is truth-telling and when there is a sort of a moral cleansing of something dark in, 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 in a place's history, uh, you have people who try to control the story and try to control their truth. Um, so I, I, I always felt like that's what I was rubbing up against uh, you know, in reporting that story. Once uh, Dr. Kimmerly and her team started to exhume the bodies at um, the boys' school, they, they felt like there were some efforts to sabotage the project. Uh, the first day they were there, before they had started the exhumations, they found a deer camera in a tree that was aimed at the cemetery, um, and they never found out who that belonged to. But somebody had, somebody had put a motion-activated uh, uh, camera up there evidently trying to watch them. Um, certain people, uh, powerful people in the community, the police chief, for instance, would come to the scene uh, to visit and incorrect information that was connected to his visit, his exploratory visit, wound up uh, being published on blogs and in uh, local uh, newspapers, new, news websites. Um, uh, beyond that, um, you know, there were people who were outright opposed to it. Uh, they felt like uh, it was a waste of taxpayer dollars. Uh, one guy, a local historian, told me uh, from the beginning there are 31 boys buried there. We know that. When GPR shows that there are 55 graves, he changed his number to say, oh, we always knew there were 55 boys buried there. Um, so, so there was a lot, there was a, lots of efforts to sort of try to manipulate 
the truth and um, and on the part of the powerful people in that community to control their their own sort of cultural narrative. I mean, it was eerie. It's an eerie place to be, and I, I don't. I'm not a, a, a superstitious person. I don't necessarily believe in supernatural occurrences, but. Uh, if I was going to shoot a horror movie, I'd think hard about using that place as a as a set. Um, there's just an eerie feel, you know. The paint has chipped off the buildings. Uh, the roofs are collapsing or have collapsed. Um, you know, this facility was opened in 1900, so a lot of those buildings are 110, 115 years old. Uh, and I knew about all the death there, and so in many ways. Um, you know, you just have this, you have this sense that there's something like sacred and uh, eerie about the place. Um, when I visited, though, for the first time, uh, I remember driving uh, onto campus and being struck by the height of the razor wire fences and being struck really by how isolated the place was. You know, it felt detached from civilization in a way. Um, uh, and the first time I was allowed to go on campus, we were there to question the, the leaders of the school and the leaders of DJJ, and it was still open. And the strangest thing happened. They were trying to convince us that uh, everything was all right. They had enough checks and balances in place. The kids weren't being abused anymore. This was in 2009. That everything is, you know, everything is good here. The kids have the opportunity to file a complaint if they feel like they're being abused or neglected. They have a 24-hour phone uh, uh, that they can use. Uh, it should be available 24 hours a day. So if they ever, ever feel like they've been abused, they can call Tallahassee and the Department of Children and Families will open an investigation. Everything's fine. When we go to leave, and uh, oh, I should mention we had... Uh, records that suggested otherwise, that suggested abuse and neglect was still rampant, you know, 109 years after the school was open. And uh, as we were leaving, um, some boys were walking in a, in a single file line, wearing uh, jumpsuits, walking in a single file line about 20 yards from us. And I'll never forget, the superintendent of the school got panicked, like she didn't want any opportunity for any of these boys to say anything within earshot of a reporter and a photographer. And she hustled us into the bed and said, let's, I'm sorry, into the van, and said, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's get out of here. And it was the strangest reaction. And I thought, this stuff is still going on, you know? Maybe not the level it was in the 50s and 60s, but this is still not a good place. And... Um, fortunately, uh, within a couple of years, the state got a new maverick secretary of the Department of Juvenile Justice and, 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 and closed the place down once and for all after 111 years of operation. The day it was scheduled to close, uh, we, I went up uh, with uh, a guy named Brian Middleton who was from Panama City Beach. And Brian had been there in the 1950s. Um, and Bryant wanted to just stand as a, a witness to the last day that this place was open. He felt a sense of accomplishment because he had been, you know, active in trying to get the place closed. Um, Bryant, by the way, was an army ranger and served in Vietnam and told me I'd rather go back to Vietnam. I'd go back to Vietnam before I'd go back to Dozier. Um, you know, still had nightmares about the place. Uh, so, uh, it felt like the end of a long, dark era. It felt good, you know. The times had sort of had been crusading, like, make the place better or shut it down. And the state, uh, you know, had promised to make it better for 111 years and never did. And so, it felt like a sense of accomplishment when they, when they finally closed it down. The state said they closed it for budget reasons. They didn't need that many beds anymore. They didn't need such a big facility. But uh, the uh, secretary of the Department of Juvenile Justice, the next time I saw her, she sort of winked at me and gave me a fist bump. 
So, um, yeah, I feel like we had a role in that. We just kept ringing the bell, you know? Uh, and many other places were, 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 were doing stories, um, but we just diligently reported this story out. Uh, not just what happened back then, but our kids being treated okay today. And the evidence suggested they weren't. And, um, you know, we just kept ringing the bell over and over and over again. We just refused to turn away. Months after starting our journey, we went to the White House Boys' reunion. Here we saw the men and their families bond. It was a hot day full of laughter, tears, and brotherhood. Regardless of race, creed, or color, these men were all brothers whose deep scars and unfathomable pain made them one. Mariana was the threat that all of the staff used in Okeechobee to uh, let you know that things could be worse. Sure, I've been researching this for a year, and the research that I've done has led me in every direction. And not too long ago, not only Saudi Arabia uh, uses the White House boys in Florida as a prime example showing the hypocrisy of the human rights issues that the United States brings up with Saudi Arabia uh, in uh, berating them for their lack of human rights. Uh, they have sadly uh, found their, uh, this information has found its way to Australia, China. China has a, a huge uh, machine that reports these things. Um, I've seen um, Venezuela has mentioned it back uh, not too long ago, and now it's becoming a real, um, I'm not a clarion call for the abuse that the United States has apparently continued to have against the juveniles, especially in the state of Florida. Many times I thought about running from the school, and uh, after I went to the White House, I thought about it a lot. And uh, some of the stories that I heard happens to you if they catch you, I didn't think about it anymore. When I first got out, uh, two to three weeks later, I got in trouble for um, stealing gasoline, siphoning gasoline out of cars, and, um, and they took me to jail. And I just kept saying while I was in the back of the police car, I don't want to go back there, I don't want to go back there. Um, and then life was bumpy from there. Never, I couldn't keep a job. Um, it took a few, quite a few years to get on any kind of track. You can't wrap your mind around somebody doing that to an adult. But to do that to a child, to do that, you know, to, to be so sick and so twisted that you could do that to another human being and then multiply that by a million, a child, I said, I feel like I'm a mother standing behind a solid foot of glass, watching them beat and murder these children, and I'm scratching the glass and pounding on it and screaming and trying to get through to save them, and I can't get through. And I actually have it wake me up. I wake up in the middle of the night screaming and, and just, you know, kicking, trying to get through the glass to get to these kids. What kind of monster does that? What kind of monster does that? These guys are going to die without ever seeing justice. Even a apology from the state, you know, somebody saying, hey, we know this happened, we're sorry. You'll never see justice. To die without seeing justice is, it's just so unfair. My body was so bloody that I couldn't walk. I had to carry a pillow almost a month. My mother didn't know, she didn't, and I was telling her what I was going through. She said, no, that ain't what the letter was saying. Say they treated you real good. I said, mama, them people like to kill me. I had to go in the water up to my neck at 11 years old and hook stumps and stuff. I had to use a chainsaw with two boys, one on one end, one on the other end, to cut logs. My mother, she couldn't comprehend what I was telling her. And I wasn't allowed to play with your kid because 
I was a boy from the former toy school. The only thing that I ever did, I studied when I was a kid, and they would pick at me so I didn't like to go to school. It, it more or less almost destroyed me for as, as a human being coming out of that place. Well, one thing I learned as a human being, as a person, and as a pastor, the people will deceive you. And I don't put on a whole lot of faith in, in people to a, for a long time because the people that I had faith in hurted me. So I more or less had a shield, but now I read the Bible a lot and I understand the Word of God a lot, and, I, and people will be peoples. And I won't let nobody destroy me. They tried once and they didn't succeed. And I promised him that I would not let man destroy me because it hurts when when you got somebody that thinks they're on your side and find out they're not. I would like people to acknowledge that truth. I think we only got one or two guys that are still surviving that know the truth. And give these guys justice, man. I tell a lot of them, I don't think nothing's gonna ever come of it because the people that treated us that way is the same people that judging us today is the state. They done us that way. And how are you gonna have just from a person that is is judging you right now? And I hope and pray that some of these guys, man, a lot of us next this November I'll be seventy years old. I done been to four funerals of the White House boys already. So we leaving here. I would like some contribution for some of these guys. I would like it for myself. But I don't wait there depending on somebody to help me when they almost destroyed me. And I hope and pray that these they get it together for some of these guys, man, because it was a living hell. For not going to school. I didn't think that was so bad. Them guys, some of them guys was in there for rape, murder, and you in like putting a sheep in a in a cell with wolves. You got to fight to survive, and outside it's just as bad. But I wish some conversation come to these guys, man. They fighting, and and I know. They're they're telling the truth, but who you going to, who gonna listen? I wish somebody didn't listen to what they're saying. share in a moment he thought he'd never see, the Apology from the state of Florida. The Apology signaled the beginning of a new era. Bill would leave feeling a sense of accomplishment, understanding that this was not the end. I'm actually hoping that uh, we'll receive the Apology from, uh, from the cabinet like we were looking for. And 
basically what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, that they reinter the kids and they do it uh, in a reverent manner. Find a new place for them. We definitely don't want them in Jackson County. And uh, see if we can get the White House considered as a uh, national monument. Put a plaque up there. Let them know what happened. Let, let, let everybody know what Florida did. Jerry told you, but in this gym is where Edgar Elton died. Oh, wow. That was the boy that they yeah, they had us. We they brought us off of the field and they brought us in to practice inside the gym. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no air conditioning in that gym, and it was hot. And the boy he ran, and I, I just think that he was. Uh, And he had a bad case of, you know, couldn't breathe. And then he fell down. This is what I was told. I saw when they brought him out, but I didn't see when he fell. But in fact, I was out on the field kicking when that happened. And they were inside the gym and they were running laps around the inside and he fell. And of course, those guys were in there, Tidwell, uh, Vic Frenzy, all these guys are in there and they tell him to get up and keep running. And he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And he got up and ran again, fell again, and died. And they continued with no, got no medical help. And I saw everybody come out of the gym, because like I said, we're just right, right there by him. Everybody came out of the gym and 45 minutes later, then they brought him out on the stretcher. And they said that he got immediate medical attention, and that's all. You know, the fences weren't here, of course, when I was here. There were no fences at all. You could walk and you could drive all the way around on this campus. In fact, people used to drive around here all the time. And. Of course, the buildings are the same, but uh, it's just really strange, eerie. You know, I went through a lot when I was here. And just strange being back. I wish I could walk inside to see it all, you know, but it just brings back a lot of memories. I want to find out it's, it's fine to find out that you've got kids in the grave, and it's, it's fine to find out who they are in the grave. Let's find out how they got there. That's what I want to find out. And if you tell me that, uh, that they died of natural causes, okay. But that doesn't happen to these kids like that. I mean, you know, kids are absolutely resilient, you know, unless they got some kind of debilitating disease, I mean, it, there's no reason for that many kids to die. It, no reason whatsoever. They, I mean, they, hey, they got people in prisons that are stabbing each other. I can understand how they get in the graveyard, but kids that are here were beaten to death. That's how they got in the graves. And they were shot if they ran away and they got caught in the woods, they were shot. If, uh, you know, the, uh, they brought the dog boys from Apalachicola to chase a boy, if they caught him in the woods, they beat him. And I believe they beat some of them to death. And I ran away from here twice. If I, the first time I got caught in Quincy, and, and or Chipley, I'm sorry. And then the second time, I got, I got all the way to Chattahoochee, but they caught me in town. And I actually believe had they caught me in the woods, I wouldn't be here today. I believe they would have killed me because they found one boy with shotgun 
glass to his chest. They got another boy that uh, had trauma and they found him in the woods. They've got another boy that was running and the sheriff's deputy is running behind him and shot him in the head. Claimed he was shooting warning shots over his head and one hit him in the head. 15 year old boy with his back to the man running away. Myself, I think they need to do a federal investigation. You cannot, you cannot let Florida do an investigation on Florida. You have to have a federal investigation done. Because it's like, it's like fighting the fox in charge of the hen house. You've got to. There were children that, you know, even if they didn't go to the White House, if, even if they didn't get beat, okay, you lived in fear of what could happen every day. Every child up there did. I mean, if, if you knew, you see somebody come back from the White House, and you look at him, he gets in the shower and you look at him. He is black and blue and red and he's got cuts on him from, from uh, being beaten, okay? You know what that had to feel like, even though you've never been there. So the psychological abuse was as bad as the physical. Anybody that went through there and stayed there any time felt that whether you whether you felt the strap you knew what it was like because you saw it on somebody else you saw it on a friend uh, well uh, you, you've got to imagine after two and a half years not having a visitor not having a letter or anything like that and I first get I get this letter from my sister you know I mean that was the greatest thing in the world. And then, you know, she, uh, I wrote her back and I said, can you help me? And she helped me out. So I did. I did everything I could to make her work. My opinion about the whole thing is this. You cannot tell me that for 111 years that this kind of treatment going on, that the good people that work there Residents of the county, residents of Mariana did not know about it. I mean, you can sit here, you, I'll sit with you on a panel. You can tell me all day long. And you, there are some of you that are still alive, by the way. I can name them. And they still live in your town. They didn't come forward. And they're not going to come forward. I'm hoping before this is over with that you'll be talking to the FBI. That's where I'm heading for, one way or the other that you will be talking to the FBI. When Troy Tidwell, when I see Troy Tidwell's obituary, I'll be satisfied. That's all I gotta say about it. That's all I wanna see. I think there was a reason for Troy Tidwell to live as old as he did. And now I think the Lord saved me for a while as restless and reckless as I've been in my life, that I would live this long to come at him. But I did tell him, I remember telling him, one of these days, Troy, you're gonna pay for this. I told him right to his face, you're gonna pay for this, sir. And he has, he has. I pray to God, and I've said this for the last five or six years, I want to live long enough to see an ending to this. 
I don't want to go to my grave like the vice president did before even he heard an apology. I want to be there when I can say to the state of Florida, this is over. Let's go on with normal life. This is over. But between now and then, I'm not going to stop until we get the truth, total truth, nothing but the truth. That's just the bottom line. I have a man. I live in Cape Coral, Florida. Punta Gorda is only about an hour's ride for me. Last Sunday, I found out that I had a White House boy in a mission in the middle of the town in Punta Gorda. Homeless, broke, somebody had stowed his shoes in the hospital, and I just came apart. I went and got him, brought him home, no place to go, no place to live, no money, just out of luck. Well. We have found him a place to go. We found his stepdaughter. He's going home in Georgia next month and hopefully live out what time he has left. He's in very bad health. I had to help him in and out of the car and he's on a roller walker. And we spent the whole day together. It's just me. It's just me. Bought him shoes. Fixed. He loves seafood. We had a good time. I cooked him clams, fried him clams. I made him hawkfish fillets, and mango snapper. I didn't think he'd ever gonna stop eating. When I took him back to the mission, I had to look at where he lives, and it's not good. My God, and he's not the only one. I have two now on the west coast, homeless. One sleeping in his van, but we do all we can do. You can only do so much. You can't, you can't cure the world, but you can sure take a good bite out of it. I will never let these men down. They are now my life. My life's almost over. Let's finish it, and let's finish it right. That I overcame my issues and what happened to me early in life as a child at FSB, Florida School for Boys in Mariana. My time in prison system, my career as a functioning and dysfunctioning alcoholic. I've managed to, over the years, come, at, come to peace with myself and what has happened to me. And I'm a better person, I'm a better man today than I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. I can look back and as evil as it was, I can't forgive everybody, but I can I can come to terms and peace with myself and, and knowing that my life has been better. I'm a better individual today. I'm a better person. I'm just, I'm thankful for the person that I am. I am thankful for the person that I have turned out to be. Very grateful, grateful that I have my health and uh, would like to see this all end. Let's uh, get in on those bitch fights. Okay, so it doesn't like yeah, fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You would have to talk to Robert Strait. Yeah. 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 One, one time I was going to stop Yeah. Well, he's probably been in a couple. Ben met with the men at the Orlando luncheon, where lawyers would serve as an intent audience, wanting to know how the atrocities suffered at the school could affect the psyche of these men. Ben 
told us what he thought of the apology from the state. Um, I was invited to address a uh, group of um, defense attorneys in Orlando who are interested in hearing the, you know, hearing the backstory to uh, uh, our investigative work at the Dozier School. Um, and uh, I asked some of these guys if, uh, if they wanted to tag along because they're the story, you know. And so uh, they, they, they were kind enough to come out and share some of their experiences. Uh, the, the investigation is wrapped up or is wrapping up. Erin uh, Kimberly from USF has presented her findings to the Florida cabinet. So it's kind of coming to a head, and I think they were just interested in the backstory of all that. I, th I feel really good for these guys. I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, since October of 2008, what they've wanted from the state is, um, is an apology. And uh, now that that happened, uh, I think they're celebrating a little bit for that. You know, just something as simple as saying, I'm sorry that the institution, that you know, the government treated you in this fashion. Uh, that alone is, um, you know, I've had a couple of them tell me that's worth more than uh, money. Uh, you know, the, the, just hearing those words c come out of the mouths of the officials, the leaders of the state. I don't, I don't really believe in closure necessarily. I think uh, for some, this, this is the, the end. For some, this is the capstone on what's been a long uh, and difficult effort. The state has finally admitted uh, that boys were tortured and abused. Um, that, that's a big deal for a lot of them, but I've had conversations with some guys since the cabinet meeting who were still hung up. What else can we do? What's next? Uh, for those guys, I'm not, I'm not sure they'll ever find, you know, a sense of closure. Uh, I was talking to Jerry just the other day and he was getting worked up again about, uh, you know, uh, about trying to press the state even further. Um, and he's being suspicious of what, you know, the political shenanigans and things like that. I was like, look, Jerry, you're gonna do this forever. Unless you find something, you need an event. You need something that you can uh, lock onto uh, that will give you like a sense of relief. So you can take this burden off and to pass it to someone else or leave it, you know, leave it at the grave of one of the dead, uh, dead kids from Dozier. So, Closure, uh, you know, it'll be different for different people. Bill Price was diagnosed with cancer and still battles with it today. Jerry Cooper is still fighting, trying to help the growing number of men whose stories mirror his own. Jerry now serves on a task force designed to determine where to bury the 55 bodies that were once on school grounds. Ben has continued his successful journalistic career, wiser and changed by the story that he followed so strongly for nearly a decade. After over a year of following the story, we realized that nothing could ever undo the damage that had been done. The physical pain the men had suffered was gone, but the pain of losing one's youth and the better part of their life simply by being labeled a problem for someone else. That kind of pain may never subside. The men have fought a long battle that may never end. The school is still there as a reminder of what was, and the true goodness of each individual shines through when helping their brothers, brothers in pain.